Um, good morning, I'm Judy Ann Files. I am one of the four facilitators for the Montrose Forum. We've been doing this for 14 years, so I am looking around and I actually am seeing some new faces that I haven't seen in the past. So if you are new, you're not on our email list, and you'd like to get that weekly email that tells you what's coming up, please let me know and I'll give you a card so you can hook up with us. Um, we have, I think we have about 650 people. We send that out to, and then we're finding, you know, we're running pretty consistently right now with 50 or so, but we have a lot of people then who watch it on the city of Montrose uh, YouTube channel, William Woody back there, do videos every week, and you can always go in and watch the programs again or watch it instead of coming here, I guess. You don't want to show us your shiny little faces. Uh, Kathy Hebers, another facilitator, and Phoebe Vinziger. This morning, I am feeling really privileged because my family's been in the Montrose area since 1872. I haven't been here quite that long. So a lot of the buildings that William's going to talk about this morning are newer or older than I am, okay? But I'm really excited about them and because a couple of them I didn't even know existed until I started getting more into this. Also of interest, this new, our media <coughs> release went out yesterday that talks about um, open positions on the Historic Preservation Commission. So if you are interested at all in getting involved with the Historic Preservation Group, please read this. It'll probably be in the newspaper and other media today. I know we have John Ewell here this morning. He's been on that for what, six years? Longer. <laughs> Longer. You've been on several, including state, right? So anyway, let me introduce to you William Reese. William is a planner for the city of Montrose. And I was, I'm sorry as I went over you. You know, I was on city council for so long and thought I lived there and I knew everybody. And then we have people like this that show up after I left. I was term limited and they hired new people and so I'm, I'm feeling kind of, I don't know, strange that here's this, this person that works for the city of Montrose and I don't know him very well. <laughs> but William is going to talk to you about his, his background, what he did to get here, and he's going to talk to us, because I specifically asked him to talk about the, the buildings that are on the historic register and show us as many pictures as he could possibly garner. Understanding that some of those buildings are sold, they may not have had cameras. I'm teasing it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm William Reese, uh, a planner with the city. I've been with the city for about three years. I've lived here for about three years, so uh, I do not claim to be an expert on Montrose history. Uh, but a little bit about my background. Uh, I moved here from New York City. A uh, little bit different, but... Um, <laughs> When I was living in New York, I uh, volunteered on Ellis Island. Uh, we were doing some historic preservation work on the island, uh, also giving tours. Um, very fascinating stuff if you ever had the chance to go out there. Uh, but when I moved here, uh, I was hired as a planner, but because of my uh, experience on Ellis Island, I was also asked to uh, kind of lead the historic preservation program with the city. And so for those of you that don't know, uh, obviously we do have a historic preservation program. Um, as Julianne mentioned, there are some, uh, currently some openings on the, the, the commission. Uh, if anyone's interested, we do encourage you to apply. Uh, the commission is made up of experts uh, in the fields of history, archaeology, architecture, construction, etc. Uh, we're very lucky that we do have a, a, a commission that um, does have that expertise. A lot of the communities in the area really struggle to fill those positions, so 
Uh, we've been very lucky that we've been able to have a commission like that. Um, just to talk about, there we go. Uh, just to talk about a little bit about um, what makes a building eligible for designation. Um, so first of all, the building needs to be at least 50 years old. Uh, there's some exceptions, but uh, generally a building needs to be at least 50 years old in order to be eligible for recognition by the city and or state federal governments uh, as a historic building. Plus, it needs to meet one of a few of these criteria, which are on this slide here. Uh, the most common ones that you see are, are criteria A and C here, uh, association with events that have made a significant contribution to history, <laughs> Uh, and or distinctive characteristics of type, period, method of construction, or artisan. Uh, but they could also be connected with persons significant in history, uh, have geographic importance, or possibility to yield information related to prehistory or history. Uh, that's typically like an archaeological site. Um, all of the sites that are designated right now are buildings, and primarily we're talking about buildings, but uh, in theory anything that is man-made could be eligible for designation. Uh, and so currently we have 15 buildings on the register. Uh, that was started in 2019, so uh, we've added between two and four buildings per year. Uh, and so I've been asked this morning to talk briefly about each one of these, um, and I'm going to do that in the order of the year that they were built. Uh, there are a lot of dates and names that I do not have memorized, so I apologize, I'm going to be referring to my notes quite a bit. So if this seems scripted, uh, it is. Um, and so, uh, obviously, given the time and 15 buildings, there's, I'm not going to have a lot of time to talk about each individual one. Uh, I could certainly go a lot in further into depth on each one, so um, I'm happy to you know, talk about some of the history on more of them uh, individually later. But uh, it's for the first building, the oldest building that we have on the register, um, this is the old Montrose County Jail. Uh, for this slideshow, I did try to include historical pictures as much as I could, but uh, I've just not been able to find any historical pictures of the old jail. Um, but if you haven't seen this, uh, it's hard to see from the street. You do need to walk down the alley. Uh, this is the alley between South First Street and Main Street, and this is right next to uh, Ace Hardware. Uh, so I encourage you to, to walk down that alley and take a look. Um, but uh, so this was uh, originally stone construction. Um, the stucco that you see on there was added later. Uh, the county started accepting bids for the jail's construction way back in 1883, and this was awarded to Charles Zahn for $4,100 at the time. Uh, this style of architecture that you see, um, this uh, kind of rectangular uh, stone structure is pretty typical of, for county jails in Colorado for the time period. Um, this is a, a side that you can't really see, um, kind of, this is facing, so this wall is facing South First Street, but there's another uh, white brick wall that's extended out of the case of hardware that's right in front of it, uh, so it forms a little bit of a courtyard here. Uh, you can see a little bit, a little square here of that original uh, stone construction. Um, the stucco was added, I believe, in the 1920s. Um, so the original jail was a 24 foot by 38 foot structure with wooden floors and uh, was reportedly very poorly built. Um, according to a grand jury in 1888, they found that the jail was, quote, shamefully insecure and a disgrace to any community. <laughs> Um, they also said that the county never should have accepted the jail from the contractors. Uh, Hugo Selig, who was the, uh, the son or the nephew, uh, I forget which, I apologize, uh, but he was one of the, 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 the relative of um, one of the founders of the town. Uh, he described the building as a ramshackle, flimsy, an eyesore, and unfit for the slightest comfort. Uh, due to the poor security, many people here did escape, uh, one of which was Butch Cassidy, um, who was jailed for allegedly stealing a horse. Um, in 1929, the county sought to make the jail escape-proof, and so they installed a cement floor, uh, which was reinforced with steel, and also included new plumbing, showers, etc. Uh, this is 
not lighted very well, but uh, this is a view of the bathroom. Uh, that original plumbing is still there. Um, and then by 1939, a new county jail was built, which is next door. Uh, the courthouse is part of President Roosevelt's New Deal. Uh, the old jail changed hands a few times to a few different business owners. Uh, it was used as coal storage for quite a while. Um, and that's probably when this piece of the interior wall was knocked out. Um, we don't know for sure. Uh, but the city did buy the building in 2016. Um, we are looking to uh, make it more available to the public. If, if none of you have been inside, it is fascinating in, inside there. So uh, we do want to make that more accessible to people to be able to look in. Uh, the next building that we have on the list is the Deals Dry Goods slash Mrs. Harris Dry Goods building, which was built in 1886. Uh, this picture was taken sometime in the late 1880s, early 1990s, 1890s, excuse me. Uh, the tall building there in the middle, uh, that's what we're talking about. Um, this building was developed by Adolphus Buttecke and Richard Deal. Um, who started the Buttecke and Deal merchandising and freight business in 1882. Uh, Buttecke was actually one of the first town trustees, and um, Deal was, excuse me, I got that flipped around. Deal was one of the first town trustees, and Buttecke was one of the first county commissioners when the county was first formed in 1883. Uh, they also actually built that wooden building all the way to the right there next door. Uh, that was built in 1884, and then they built the city's, uh, it was the city's first brick building. Uh, this, that was built in 1886. Uh, this was also the first fireproof building built on Main Street and was the most expensive at the time. Uh, Buttecke retired in 1892 and Deal became his sole owner of the business. Uh, you can see here on the side of the building the signs for Deal's dry goods. He did apparently begin having some financial troubles and did need to take out loans, and apparently he defaulted on those loans uh, and ran away to develop some buildings in Alaska. Uh, apparently he did have some success up there, and so he did move back down to Montrose. Um, but starting in 1902, the Harrises would begin operating a dry goods store out of this building, uh, and they would stay there until 1919 when they moved somewhere else in town. Uh, the next building is right next door, uh, which is the J.F. Wilson Clothing slash Missouri building, which was built in 1899. Uh, the wood building that was next door to the dry goods store, that burned down in 1895. And so the property was sold to William Block, who built this building. Uh, Block was originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and so the building was named the Missouri Building. Um, John F. Wilson opened a clothing store in the building when it opened in 1899. Uh, the store was later purchased by Fred Cotton in 1913 and became the F.E. Cotton Outfitter. There were also four spaces on the, on the second floor which had a variety of occupants, but a lot of the early medical practices in Montrose were based out of here, uh, including Dr. Meredith, who was the company surgeon for the railroad, Dr. Price, who was a dentist, Dr. Neville, an ear, nose, and throat specialist, uh, Dr. Washburn, another dentist. Uh, later on, there was also a florist, a real estate agent, and uh, many others, too many to name. Uh, it did also become an army recruiting station during World War I, and the first floor was also a pharmacy from 1918 to 1974. Uh, the next two buildings on the list both had the historical name of the Montrose Electric Light and Power Company. Uh, if you look at our list of historical buildings, they are both listed with the same name, and it's not a typo. Uh, they, they are two different buildings. Uh, the first one was built in 1899, when the company's headquarters were located on the corner of uh, what was then Front Street and Third Street, uh, is now Maine and Townsend. They planned a 40-foot by 60-foot building that housed their power operations, which were uh, previously right next to the train tracks. Uh, this building, it also housed an 18 by 40-foot boiler room and sleeping quarters for a live-in superintendent. Uh, at that time in Montrose, there were approximately 850 lights to be powered. Uh, this was obviously growing very rapidly. And so this is what the building originally looked like. Um, we're not sure of the exact date of this picture, but it is sometime between 1899 and 1904, and this is the building we're talking about. Uh, obviously
obviously, you can see there's a big smokestack there. Obviously, that is gone, but that is right above where the boiler room would have been. Um, the, and you can see that the, you know, I can't really see it in it very well in this picture, but uh, the original construction would have been brick that has been stuccoed over. Uh, I'm not sure it's the exact date of when the stucco was put on. Um, and so this is the building, this is slightly out of date, but uh, this was the building as of a few years ago. Uh, you can see the roof uh, has largely remained original. Um, they have done some renovations to it uh, pretty recently in the past few months. Um, but the roof shape has been maintained and some of the open openings are original. And then I recommend if you peer down kind of the side of the wall on the left of the building, uh, you can see some of that original brick construction. Um, I did my best to get a picture, but it's very narrow back there, so <laughs> didn't do a very good job. But uh, I recommend you take a peek down that uh, tiny little alleyway uh, next time you walk by that building. You can see some of the uh, original construction. Uh, and so this wasn't a powerhouse for long, as the light power company did quickly outgrow the building. And so they sold it to F.H. Posey, who converted the property into a storeroom and feed warehouse. Uh, the, since they were outgrowing the building, the company needed to move into a bigger space. And so they bought this building, which we now know as Sampler Square. Uh, this was built in 1904, and they moved the boilers and generators into the room all the way to the left here. Uh, they began operations in here in 1905. Uh, once again, you can see the old smokestacks. Uh, obviously, they're also gone. Um, this is the inside of the building. This is one of the original generators. Uh, they did also build an ice plant and some cold storage rooms. And those were, I thought I had another picture, sorry. Uh, the cold storage room would have been all the way to the right here. Um, Nowadays, again, this is better known as Sampler Square. Uh, you can see that the building has been generally preserved pretty well. Uh, notice that all of these window openings still retain their original shapes when you compare these two. Uh, the one major modification, uh, if you look all the way to the south of the building, uh, this, is the, this is where the room would have stood where the boilers were. Uh, you can see that the room has been demolished. You can see some remnants of the brick wall uh, along the sides here. I don't know why that was torn down, but it was. Um, obviously, this building nowadays is connected to the radium sampler, which I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, that was connected sometime in the 70s. Uh, the Montrose Electric Light and Power Company would merge a few times, uh, eventually into the Western Colorado Power Company, and they started using this as a uh, reserve facility, not for a primary facility. And so next up, we do have the Coors Building, which was built in 1905. Uh, this is right across the street from the historical train station slash museum. Uh, Adolf Coors founded the Coors Company in Golden in 1873, and the company began building saloons to sell their beer all over the state, including here in Montrose. Uh, newspapers announced that the Coors Company was building a beer depot with boarding rooms on the second floor. Uh, that was announced in 1904. The building was finished in 1905. Uh, note the stone plaque at the top. Uh, maybe a bit hard to see there, but it does say Coors. Uh, that's pretty common for a lot of these commercial buildings on Main Street and nearby uh, at the time. Um, there were some rumors published in the newspaper in 1907 that alleged that Carrie Linnell's, quote, house of ill repute, unquote, would be moving into the second floor of the building. Uh, in 1907, the state of Colorado passed some of its first bone dry laws, which allowed cities and counties to outlaw the sale of alcohol. Uh, and a lot of cities quickly started adapting those dry town laws. Uh, Montrose had a city election in 1909 and that essentially became an election between the pro-saloon and the anti-saloon candidates. Uh, the anti-saloon mayoral candidate, John Allen, did win, and eight out of the nine alderman seats were won by the anti-saloon candidates. And so the city quickly passed several anti-alcohol laws, which essentially shut down all of the saloons, uh, including this one. And so given that they couldn't sell alcohol, this 
couldn't be used as a saloon anymore, so it became the Vandenberg Hotel. Uh, this is really the only historical picture of the building we've managed to find. It's kind of in the background there, but um, this picture was taken on September 23rd, 1909. Uh, this was when President Taft was visiting Montrose for the opening of the Gunnison Tunnel. Uh, later on in 1941, the Coors Building became the Cassius Pool Hall, which became a popular place for Hispanic men to gather who were barred from other establishments. And so the next building is the Montrose Potato Growers Association, which was built in 1908. Uh, you've all probably seen that they've been doing some pretty extensive renovation work on the building. Uh, they have received some tax credits from the state, which is a, one of the benefits of being having a designated building. Uh, you can potentially get tax credits from the state. Um, the, the Montrose Fruit and Produce Association did have a wood frame building on the site, which burned down on June 22, 1908. Uh, they decided to build a more modern brick building on the same site that would cost approximately $6,000 at the time. The architect was John Antrobus. Uh, who's going to be a recurring name throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, construction supposedly finished in October of 1908, and the Fruit and Produce Association moved in on October 23rd. So we just missed its anniversary. Um, at some point, I'm not sure exactly, but by 1951, the Montrose Fruit and Produce Association became the Montrose Potato Growers Association. Uh, the basement was also used as cold storage by several of the restaurants in town and even the Grand Imperial Hotel down in Silverton. Uh, the upper floor was, of course, adjacent to the train tracks, very convenient for an important agricultural town like Montrose. Uh, this would continue to serve as an agricultural warehouse up until the 1960s. In 1909, we have the S.H. Nye Building, which is named after Samuel Huntington Nye. Uh, a little bit of background about him, he was born in New York in 1848, but became one of the earliest homesteaders in the valley, settling in what is now Olathe. Uh, he had one of the first orchards in Montrose County. Uh, in 1883, he was appointed by the governor to be one of the first county commissioners, along with Buttigy, as mentioned earlier. Uh, he sold the farm and the orchard in 1906 and moved to Montrose. He bought these these two lots here for $6,560 and planned a, uh, plan a two-story building, which was also designed by John Antrobus. Uh, the plans called for commercial space on the bottom floor and space for the Central Business College and the U.S. Land Office on the second floor. Uh, lumber shortages at the time delayed the completion of the building, but the first floor opened with a clothing store in late 1909 and the second floor was completed in January of 1910. Uh, the first floor had a pretty wide variety of tenants, including the Denver Music Company, a Studebaker and Oldsmobile dealership, uh, meetings for the Montrose Republican Party, taxidermy exhibits, etc. Uh, the second floor was originally used by the U.S. Land Office as planned, but a May 4th, 1919 fire started upstairs at 1 in the morning. Uh, likely from a cigarette thrown into a box of sawdust, which was being used as a spittoon. Uh, luckily, the, first, the fire department was right around the corner at the time, so it was pretty much contained just to this building, but it did cause the land office to, to vacate. The second floor was later used for a variety of things, including a, a tailor, a chiropractor, a beauty shop, etc. Uh, this picture is uh, zoomed in a bit, so it's mostly cut off, but the contraption that you see in front of the building uh, this picture was taken in, in 1919 when they were first paving Main Street. And next up is the KP building, it stands for Knights of Pythias. Uh, this is on the corner of South First and Cascade. You've probably seen the renovation of work that they've been doing for the hotel. Uh, this is a fraternal organization which was founded in Washington, D.C. in 1864 by Justice Rat <coughs> and they had chapters all over the country. Uh, the Montrose chapter purchased the property in 1908 to build their own meeting place. Again, architect John Andrebus. Uh, the meeting space in the lodge would be on the second floor. Uh, originally, the first floor was planned for an opera house, but that was scrapped and it became a commercial space for Wonder Mercantile. The building was finished in 1909, and the second floor was used for the Knights of Pythias, 
but also for musical performances, uh, stockholder meetings for the Fruit and Produce Association, and the Elks Club rented out a room up there. Uh, this picture is from 1913, when Tony Monell, who's in the center, uh, he was the postmaster of Montrose at the time. He's being presented a car by a uh, local cattleman. Uh, later on, the building would be used as a Safeway. Uh, again, notice the stone plaque at the top that says KP Building. Um, the SH9 building, I didn't point it out, but that also has a plaque, so if you walk by, look up at the top, and you'll see these stone plaques. Uh, next up on the list is the Montrose Fire Department Number 1 building, which is from 1910. Uh, Montrose had an informal volunteer fire department very early on, but this original department was housed in little more than a shack. Uh, as the town grow, grew bigger and bigger, it became clear that the fire department needed to grow with it, and this was especially evident when the insurance rates for uh, the town were kept rising. Uh, because the insurance company saw the fire danger was too high. Uh, a more formal fire department was organized in 1908 with a new fire chief, G.W. Rippey. Uh, this picture is from 1908, and this is the first uniformed firefighters in town. Uh, they obviously needed a bigger home, and so in 1910, the firehouse was built. This is today right next to Centennial Plaza. This picture was taken in 1915, and you can see the horse-drawn fire wagon. Um, Obviously, the horses were used very early on, and the first floor was actually the stables for the horses. Um, obviously, the, the first floor facade has been changed, but the rest of the building has been preserved pretty well. Um, again, you can see that there's a, a plaque at the top that says MFT, and another plaque right above the first floor that says number one. Um, and then one interesting thing, if you notice, there's a wooden beam sticking out of the building, the side of the building here, right above the kind of what looks like a lowered window. Um, that was actually for a pulley system to bring the hay. Uh, they would store the hay on the second floor and bring the, the hay down for the horses on the first floor. Uh, I recommend you walk down that alley too because that original wood beam is still there. Um, so they would keep using the horse-drawn fire wagon up until 1923. That's the year this picture was taken. Uh, this is the fire chief at the time, Jim, Jim Donnelly, who was marching the horses out for the last time, and they replaced that with their first fire truck. Um, as the years went on, the fire trucks got bigger and bigger. They needed to uh, renovate that front facade there in order to make it a bigger entrance. But uh, like I said, the rest of the building has been pretty well preserved. Here it is today, like I said, uh, that original wood beam is still there. Um, so I recommend you walk down the alley, uh, all of the alleys. There's some really interesting things in the, the back of the buildings that people don't necessarily see very often. Um, and then way at the back, this back portion was originally used as a jail as well. And so those, uh, those original jail windows are still here. Um, this one on the left here has been uh, as best as I can tell, has not been modified. The one on the right has some slight modifications, but is still generally pretty well preserved. Um, so the next oldest building that we have is the Denver and Rio Grande Depot, built in 1912. Uh, obviously, the train tracks came to Montrose before that, and there was a series of smaller train stations that were built for a very small town. Uh, as Montrose was bigger and bigger, these were insufficient. And so this picture is from 1885, and this is what we had as a train depot back then. Um, the citizens of Montrose lobbied to the railroad in order to build a bigger depot, uh, which they did. That was also too small. Uh, and then this latest depot, the one that we still have around today, was completed in 1912. Um, this is a picture very soon after it was completed. Um, this was used as an advertisement for the railroad. Uh, as a bit of an exemplary ex uh, structure. Um, and this is an architectural style that matches a lot of the train stations from the time. Uh, this is Mission Revival style architecture, uh, which is exemplified by its red hip roof, those curved parapets that you see in the middle, and this is basically mirrored on the other side. Uh, also note the sign uh, says Montrose, welcoming passengers to Montrose. 
This picture was taken on November 21st, 1951, and this is the Mountaineer passenger train and narrow gauge locomotive 784. You're sitting in front of the depot. And then this picture is from March 21st, 1953. Uh, the building's a bit obscured, but you can see that uh, it has been preserved remarkably well. Um, this building is actually the only building in Montrose that is recognized on the city, the county, the state, and the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, so this is probably one of the best uh, examples of a, a preserved building here in town. Um, and of course, I, I'm, this houses the, uh, the Historical Museum today. Um, I am also on the board of that, so I have to do my duty and recommend you all check out the museum. Um, moving on to the next building, and uh, this is why Sampler Square got its name. This is the Montrose Radium Ore Sampler, built in 1918. This was built by O. Barlow Wilmarth and was completed in 1918. Uh, as you probably know, uh, a lot of the radium ore was mined in the area, uh, especially in the Paradox Valley, and so Barlow Wilmarth sought to capitalize on this, and he built the, the ore sampler here. Uh, supposedly at the time it was the world's only commercial radium sampler. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true, but that's what the newspaper said. Um, unfortunately, this is really the only historical picture that I've managed to find. Uh, it's really poor quality, but this is a picture from the newspaper, uh, newspaper article published in 1918 announcing that the uh, radium ore sampler was operational. Um, the ore would have been sampled here and shipped to the mills, largely in Pennsylvania, and uh, mostly radium was sampled here, but there was some uranium and vanadium ore, as well as some others likely. Uh, this was, the radium was used for illuminating paint during World War I, uh, and this was also right next to the train tracks at the time. Uh, supposedly some of the radium that Mary Curie used in her experiments did come through this building. Uh, when World War I ended, the sampler did still get used, but the price of radium ore dropped, and so business slowed. Uh, by 1941, this was used as a wholesale meat distribution plant, and later used as offices for the Hill Petroleum Company. The Methodist Episcopal Church of Montrose is next, and the Methodists in Montrose date all the way back to the city's origins in 1882. Uh, they originally held their services in a carpenter shop, which they did purchase, but this became too small. Uh, this picture here is actually the first church that they built in 1886. Uh, this would have been on the corner of North Second and Cascade. Uh, this would only last a few years. The building was in bad shape because of soil instability, and uh, it did get condemned in 1906. And um, so the church trustees wanted to build a bigger church, one that they planned would be suitable for a town of 25,000 people. Uh, they got an architect named Thomas Barber, who has a lot of buildings which are uh, nationally recognized today, uh, including the City Hall in Colorado Springs, uh, a few significant churches around California, uh, Denver, Pueblo, etc. The interior design of the church was intended to follow the Akron plan, which was common for churches of the time period. Uh, this is a design that's intended to facilitate Sunday school instruction. As we can see here, this is sometime in the 1920s. The church's construction was actually interrupted by the U.S.'s involvement in World War I. Uh, there was a shortage of supplies and labor, and so the basement was roofed over, and they held services in this basement up until uh, World War I ended. Construction began again in 1917, and the church was finished in 1920. The exterior architecture is a great example of Romanesque revival style construction. Um, this picture is from sometime in the 1940s, and this and the train depot are uh, probably the best preserved buildings that I can think of in the city. Um, this is also recognized by the federal and state government as a historically significant building. Uh, you can see that aside from some modifications for ADA accessibility, the exterior pretty much looks the same. Uh, there is an addition from the 90s, which is in the back uh, of this picture, but aside from that, the building is pretty much unchanged. Uh, the bell tower, the wooden louvers, the, uh, the decorative parapet, 
uh, the stained glass windows, the tan brick, uh, the stone lower, lower portions. Um, these all are, have been recognized and have been uh, described in the uh, National Register of, of Historic Places as a, a very important structure. So um, we're, we're certainly happy that uh, this can also be recognized by the city as well. Um, moving on, we have the Montrose City Hall building. Uh, which was completed in 1926, and this is also federally and state recognized. Uh, in the early 1920s, supposedly city council had been meeting in a decaying building with cracked walls. Apparently it didn't keep out the rain. Uh, city offices were not centralized and were scattered around many different buildings all around town. And so in 1925, a local women's club met with city council to ask what steps they could take in order to build a new city hall, uh, as well as a library and prepared a petition to request the city take action. And so in 1926, the council ordered a $30,000 bond issue to be submitted to voters, which was approved by a vote of 203 to 178. Uh, John Antrobus was once again the architect, and the cornerstone was laid on September 24th, 1926, by that woman's group. Uh, the building was occupied in early 1927. The building housed the offices for the city manager, water superintendent, city clerk, city council, and a library on the first floor, and the police department on the second. Uh, the building is uh, definitely one of the more ornate structures in town. Uh, it's largely a mission revival style structure with some art deco influence. Um, next time you walk by, take a look at all the decorative brickwork that's on the facade. Uh, the national nomination boards really do take note of that brickwork and uh, recognize it as very important. And so, finally to round it out, the, the youngest building that's on our register is the Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks building on Cascade Ave. Uh, you might know it today as the Visitor Center on the first floor and the City Council Chambers on the second. Um, this picture is from 1927. Uh, the Elks was first formed in Montrose in 1906. Uh, as mentioned previously, they met originally in the Knights of Pythias building. And they actually purchased the property for this building in 1907, uh, but they didn't build on, uh, this, this building until 20 years later. Uh, again, World War I was a pretty big factor in that. John Antrobus was once again the architect, and the building supposedly cost $34,600. Uh, at that time, there were 475 members of the Elks, and they would hold social gatherings on the second story, and apparently there was a bowling alley in the basement. Uh, the Elks building was used by the Elks up until 1969, and then Colorado Western College took it over uh, to use it as a two-year college, which only lasted until 1972. Uh, Montrose County Social Services used it from 1976 until 2003, when the city acquired the building. Uh, this is a bit of a blend of architectural styles. The uh, national designation form shows it as partially mission revival, uh, late Gothic revival, and craftsman. And the decorative brickwork on this building is also highly praised on its national nomination forms. Uh, so again, take a look at the brickwork uh, next time you walk by. And so those are, those are the 15 buildings. Um, obviously, we you know, encourage anyone that owns a historic building to look into designating it. Um, we're, you know, very happy to uh, uh, add more buildings to the, the register. It is an entirely voluntary program, so we don't want to force anyone to, to, to designate their buildings, but um, we do think that um, uh, anything that is historic, uh, we're, you know, certainly happy to have. Uh, some of the benefits to having a, a designated building um, for commercial structures, we do offer a facade improvement program, which is a matching grant program from the city, up to $25,000. Uh, a building does not have to be designated to be eligible for that, but if it is, um, there is additional funding that's available. Um, and then, like I mentioned, a building could potentially get uh, tax credits from the state if they are designated. And so um, that is my spiel. Um, again, uh, 
I don't know everything, so I'm happy to take some questions if you have them. Uh, it's very possible that the answer might be, I don't know, or I need to do some research, but uh, I think we'll open up, up to questions. Since the picture's up there. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, I grew up with many stories of my parents going to the Elks building in the big ballroom, and they would dance and party and do that. We just lived two blocks from there, so that was convenient. And then when I came on council, I go into what was the ballroom, and then which is now city council chambers and municipal court, and the floor was squeaky. And Virgil Turner with the city of Montrose would say to me, Judy and that's okay. Think about that squeaky floor. That's the, well, because your parents dance there and because Debbie Reynolds and John Wayne both dance there too. So enjoy the squeak in the floor. <laughs> Okay, questions. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, early in your talk, I, at least three times you mentioned cold storage. What did that mean in 1900? How did they cool it? Um, so they would have used uh, large, like, uh, Storage with ice in it uh, in order to keep a room cold. Um, this was, you know, before refrigerators were available in every home. So, um, you know, it, it, it was difficult for, a, a, you know, businesses or individuals to keep things cold. Um, exactly how they were built, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, it essentially would have been a big room with some ice. During my time with City, I know twice we came up with buildings here in town who had built their cold storage out under the street. So it wasn't even under their building. One of them was the Daily Bread building. That cold storage was out under Cascade Avenue. And the other one had to do with um, Sanford Square. That cold storage was out there. And I found out when they redid Rio Grande Avenue that Whoa, there's this box under there that... <laughs> okay. I'm going to now... Excuse me. Thank you. That was a really uh, great and interesting presentation. So you talked about some photos you can find. Can you talk briefly about your research process, uh, how you go about uh, finding artifacts and finding pictures and, and doing the research? Uh, yeah, so... Um... One of the best sources that I found uh, for some of the historical pictures is the Denver Public Library. Uh, they have a Western history collection, uh, which includes you know all of the Western Slope, but in including Montrose. And so they have a good resource to find some pictures. Um, Fort Lewis College has a, a pretty good uh, library of pictures of Montrose. And, and then there's some other random uh, sources that I found. The University of Utah has a lot of historical pictures of the Electric Light and Power Company. Uh, I'm not sure why, but they do. Um, and then, uh, as far as the information, uh, the best source that I found, um, the, uh, I'm forgetting the exact name of it, but there's a, a website where uh, all of the newspapers in Colorado I don't know about all of them, but most of the newspapers from Colorado from uh, early 1880s to 1930 or so, don't know the exact dates, but uh, they've all been scanned. Um, they've done optical text recognition on them, so you can search uh, for newspaper articles relevant to a specific person or building. Um, and then just using um, you know, my sources for people on the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, Sally Johnson down at the museum is uh, really an expert. She, I always say if she can't find it, then it doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, I try to try to use a, as many different sources as I, as I can. Um, sometimes they're just some one-off thing, but uh, those are the best resources I've found. You mentioned earlier about the street names changing, uh, like North Third to Main. Do you know what year that happened? The reason I ask is because we have, I volunteer at the genealogy center, and we have people come in 
And we have a lot of old plat maps and stuff, but we don't know when that changed. Um, yeah, I got a question about this a few weeks ago, and I forget exactly. I don't have it in my notes, unfortunately. Um, but it was, uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, sometime around 1913, 1914, somewhere around then, uh, I forget exactly. That's where it gets confusing because when you look at the 1910 census, uh, the uh, Latham House, built in 1902, it shows on the census a Main Street address. So it's a little wonky. Yeah, it is. Um, and I, I, I tried to do some research on it for someone who was asking me, and um, I wasn't able to come up with a clear answer, unfortunately. Uh, that's something that requires further research. I just don't know for sure for some of that right now. So was the city first aligned with the river? Or was it aligned once the railroad got here? Uh, I believe it was first aligned with the river. There's something, Pomona School was somewhat the center for the city for a while, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Pomona, I think so. Yeah. A long way south of Main Street. Remembering old things. Questions? Uh, the uh, President's uh, Music Academy on East Main is in the building. It has a second story with a spectacular. Uh, stained glass, ceiling sort of thing. Um, I was kind of surprised that that wasn't done the last year. Is it too recent, or what is the story on that? Uh, it would certainly be eligible, uh, but again, this is a voluntary uh, register, and so um, we don't designate a building unless the, the property owners uh, want to, and you know, some don't want to because there, there are advantages to being designated and there are disadvantages. So uh, if, if someone doesn't want to have their building designated, that's certainly fine. What is uh, the vintage of the ceiling? Sorry? How old is that? Uh, I, I don't really know too many details about that building because I haven't really dug into it very much. Um, it is nationally and state designated, so uh, there is information out there, but I don't, I don't have it in my notes. That was originally a Masonic lodge, and so that's that's why the ornate ceiling, and at one time there was a wooden railing around the outside. If you're familiar with uh, Masonic lodges, that's part of how they set up their ritual and and where people have their positions to be. I was a Job's daughter, which is the young female version of being a mason. So, yeah. You have a question. Have a question. Um, so, Will, what about historic homes? I mean, I know there's a lot like the Townsend and some that have been designated. Is that not something the museum does or do you do research on them? Um, yeah. Residences, historic residences are certainly eligible. Um, I've had a few inquiries about it and we're likely going to move forward with a handful potentially the next year. Um, but uh, just so far we don't have any on the register. Um, we may in the future, but um, as of right now, there are none. The, the old Phil Townsend house on the corner of Townsend and Phil? It is on the National Register, it is not on the City Register. <coughs> Do you mean you're out of questions this time? Okay, Robert, here I come. I have a couple. What about the uh, county building south of the post office? And what does B P O E stand for? So the the county building, um, 
the, the old courthouse, again, that is on the National Register and the State Register. Uh, it's not on the City Register. Um, BPOE stands for Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks. Thank you. I grew up without being the best people on earth. <laughs> if not any more questions, let's thank William for this presentation.